All right, everyone. Hi, my name is Melissa Egan, and I'm the events committee chair for our Partnership for Extraordinary Minds, which is hosting tonight's webinar. I'd like to welcome everyone to virtual speech and OT, making it work for our students with ASD, the third webinar in our online series this month of important topics parents of children with special needs should know during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our featured speaker tonight is Christina Morrissey, Director of Outpatient Speech Language Pathology at the Treatment and Learning Centers based in Rockville. After I'm finished with logistics, I'll be turning over the mic to our Executive Director, Sue Keisler, who will introduce Tina. Tina will speak for approximately 45 minutes, after which she will answer questions submitted beforehand by participants and on chat. Some of these questions have already been incorporated into Tina's presentation. After she completes her program, Sue and our board president, Laura Gordon, will be reading submitted questions aloud to Tina. Please remember that if you don't have your question answered, Tina will put up a slide at the end of her presentation with her contact information. And you are welcome to contact her with questions after tonight's event. Some quick ground rules. Everyone was muted upon their entrance to the call tonight, and we ask that you do remain muted for the duration of the presentation. We have nearly 90 registrants for tonight's webinar, so we want to be able to minimize echo and background noise so that everyone can hear the audio. We also ask if you will please stop your video, which will enable us to focus on Tina and her presentation this evening. Secondly, this call is being recorded, so you will make available the recording on our website within the next day or two. And lastly, we invite you to offer any questions or comments through Zoom's chat feature. If you haven't used the chat function in Zoom before, you can access it on a desktop or a laptop by hovering your cursor toward the bottom of your screen and clicking on the icon that looks like a conversation bubble. On a tablet or smartphone, you can tap in either the right or left-hand corners of your screen and tap on the icon that either looks like three horizontal dots, the word chat, or the word more, and any of those should get you to the chat function. I also want to remind everyone that questions submitted in chat are associated with your username, so they are not submitted anonymously. If you would like to submit an anonymous question, please send a private message to our board president, Laura Gordon, in chat with your question. And with that, I will turn the mic over to Sue. Sue. Thank you, Melissa. And welcome to all of you who are joining us tonight. I'm Sue Keisler, Executive Director of XMinds, and I want to introduce as well Laura Gordon, our board president. Laura is going to be monitoring the comments and questions in the chat. There she is. Um, thank you all for joining XMinds' third webinar in our new Thursday night webinar series. We started this series to help support parents who are facing a lot of new challenges while MCPS is doing distance learning. These webinars are going to continue to be on Thursday nights at 7, at least through the end of April. The format will be the same each time. We bring in an expert to present for the first half of the program and then give you a chance to get your questions answered during the second half. Tonight's expert, here to talk about how parents can help their kids get the most from their speech and OT sessions when those services are delivered virtually, is Christina Morrissey. I want to just mention that the topic of how to handle speech and OT sessions has risen to the top of our list of hot issues because we've been hearing from a lot of parents whose kids were receiving speech or OT in school and they were wondering how their kids can continue to make progress in a virtual environment. Since the transition to distance learning, we've seen a big range of what students are receiving from MCPS in the way of speech. Some parents have told us they're receiving nothing because of MCPS's concerns about HIPAA or for a variety of other reasons. Some are receiving parent coaching, putting the parents in the position of therapist, and some are actually receiving one-on-one -on -one or even small group synchronous speech therapy sessions over an online platform. So parents' experiences have run the gamut. We're hoping that whatever obstacles parents are encountering in getting speech or OT services delivered or making those services work for their child, Tina's presentation tonight will be useful for addressing and hopefully overcoming some of those obstacles. With that background, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. 
Tina Morrissey is a speech language therapist and director of outpatient speech language pathology at the Treatment and Learning Centers, which is a nonprofit located in Rockville that offers a wide range of therapeutic services to clients of all ages and also runs the Catherine Thomas School. Tina has been working as a speech language pathologist, both evaluating and treating children since 2004. She has extensive experience collaborating with families, advocates, educators, and children to develop and implement individualized plans plans of care for clients. Tina is skilled in providing consultation services and training in a variety of settings, schools, community, home, centers, centers like the treatment and learning centers, in fact. We are very grateful to Tina for giving us the benefit of her experience and expertise tonight. And without any further ado, Tina, thanks again for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sue. Well, I would like to thank X Minds for providing this wonderful opportunity so that we can all hopefully answer some questions and um, be able to best support our kids while such craziness is happening um, in the world. So um, I'm very appreciative for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. So thank you for having me. Um, what we're gonna talk about, of course, is our you know, virtual speech and um, OT. Um, and one of the things um, I think is important um, when we're talking about that is to have an understanding of um, what um, those services really are. Let's see, where's my, here we go, it's not going, here we go. Okay, perfect. Um, what those services really are. So when we're thinking about teletherapy or telehealth, what does that include? So um, there's two kinds of telehealth services. Um, one is synchronous, and that's really what people usually think of as a traditional model. Um, that is where you're having an audio, a video um, component, and it is happening live, and there's a, a back and forth. Um, so that's a synchronous model. Generally, that is delivered on a platform such as Zoom, um, and so that's uh, like the, the traditional telehealth model. Telehealth services have been happening um, for at least you know, 10, 12 years now. Um, so this isn't a new model. This is just something that I think is new to a lot of folks given um, you know, the, the current world um, health pandemic. Um, the other uh, model is called asynchronous, and that is also called store and forward. And so the idea with that is that you would maybe make a video um, or some sort of um, maybe photos or something um, in, in the medical field that could be lab work or x-rays, things like that, and then send those to the clinician or to the client, um, to, the, to the student. Um, so that's store and forward or asynchronous. What we're doing now um, in order to address the learning needs of our, um, our students, I think is mo mostly what we would call distance learning, um, which is really just a creative problem solving um, opportunity here. And um, we're using a combination of models. Some of it is going to be telehealth, the synchronous, um, actual live one-on-one -on -one, you know, therapy, or even just meeting back and forth. And then I think some of it is also gonna be asynchronous, sending videos. And then a lot of, like I said, other creative problem solving. Um, you know, maybe it's going to be sending um, links or apps or online um, work or um, some carryover work to do at home, but it's gonna be a combination of those things. So when we're thinking about the models, um, it's important to keep in mind a medical model and an educational model. And this really helps, I think, understand what the services that um, school systems can provide versus the, the services that private practices can provide. So school services follow an educational model. This is different than the model that private practices, um, that could be clinics like treatment and learning centers, hospitals, that, um, that, that other um, providers follow. It's not the same. Um, a lot of people seem to think that it's the same service just in a school, but it's really not. Um, we have different regulations where we have different requirements. Um, the, the models are, are very different. So when you think of a school service, um, an educational model, the related services like occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, music therapy, speech therapy, and um, counseling. Um, those really are, the job of those related services is to support curriculum. And so in um, you know, times like this, it's gonna be very hard for SLPs and OTs to be able to support curriculum if the curriculum is only being delivered for three hours a week. Um, 
in the school model, um, there aren't a lot of individual services. The school model is a lot of push-in services where the SLP or the OT goes into the classroom. Um, it's a lot of small groups. There are not very many individual sessions. So a clinician could have 60, 70 kids on their caseload and most of those kids, those 60, 70 clients or, or students are getting their services in a small group. Um, the other thing about the school model is that um, the, the reason that they do this, the small groups and the push-in services is the focus is, the, the idea is to reduce how much time a student is pulled out of the classroom. The goal is to have them in the classroom as much as possible. This model doesn't translate very well to telehealth on this large scale um, because there's such little notice to be able to prepare um, sufficiently and, and modify. Telehealth services, um, synchronous telehealth services are delivered in the school systems. There are plenty of schools who do get telehealth services where there will be a student and maybe an aide or a teacher sitting together on one side and the clinician on the other side of the screen delivering the child's IEP, delivering services. And that could even be in a group setting, you know, two, three children and an aide. Um, so it, it does happen. The problem is, is just translating um, what children's current IEPs and current service delivery models are to, um, to the problems that, you know, we, we have right now. Um, the other thing to know about school services is that evaluations don't translate very well to telehealth, given, again, this current situation. When we do evaluations in private practice, um, there are um, some more um, tools that we have available to us than the school system um, doesn't because of the rules of, of the laws of, of the IEP. And so a lot of times when you're testing a student via telehealth in school, again, there's another clinician or teacher or staff person on the other side to help facilitate that test, um, you know, to make sure that the, the child's participating and attending and, and such. So that's going to be very hard to do um, in, a, in a home setting. So some, some um, difficulties with that. Um, in private practice, schools, or I'm sorry, clinics and hospitals, we follow the, the medical model. So we're not bound by an IEP um, and we're more likely to provide individual services and we're less likely to provide groups. And the reason is, is that um, it's very hard to schedule groups and, um, you know, to get more than one family um, in the same room at the same time, the same day. And then um, the more prevalent and unfortunate reason that there aren't so many groups in private practice anymore um, is because insurance doesn't cover them. And so, you know, it can be um, very um, cost prohibitive to have to pay out of pocket for, for groups. Um, those of us in private practice who follow the medical model, we use a developmental model. So we can target a wider variety of skills. We don't have to support just the curriculum. We can really support the lifespan. We can support um, you know, any of the, the skills that a child needs. Um, we don't have to sort of bound by um, common core or just a curriculum in general. Um, so a lot more flexibility. Um, the other thing about private practice is that we have regular contact with parents. You know, a lot of our sessions in private practice, a portion of the session is meant for debriefing with the family. Um, and so we're using um, carryover work. We're, we're giving the families on a, a weekly basis things to do, checking in with them, how's it going. Um, and we're really able to communicate very, you know, well and, and regularly uh, with our families face to face. Um, and so that, that sort of translates a little bit better to the, a telehealth um, model. Um, the other thing to know about our private practices, and especially TLC and our experience in, in transferring from our brick and mortar to a telehealth model in, in two weeks was we have um, a, a lot of staff that can help us. So, you know, in the... Um, in, in our building, at least, you know, I had administrative assistants who were um, making PDFs, sending me PDFs of books and materials. Um, they're mailing me protocols so I can do testing. Um, we have people who are working on the billing and calling insurance companies and who are doing scheduling and sending the paperwork and um, people who are looking up lesson materials for me. So um, we have a lot of help um, to be able to sort of get things, you know, off the ground. And so I think some of that um, is why it is so hard for school systems or even private schools, um, um, you know, Montgomery County, Frederick, um, to be able to move their model, their educational model to telehealth. And I think that's why there's just um, 
so many, so much frustration and um, it's taken, you know, longer than some of the private practices um, because of some of those, some of those reasons. So we sort of have an understanding now, I think, of what telehealth is, um, you know, either the traditional model or, um, you know, some of the alternatives um, like the video and, and sending. Um, but how do we know if telehealth is going to be a good fit? And so when I'm going to, to um, think about telehealth going forward, I'm going to think about the tradition and talk about this traditional model, the, the idea where telehealth is mostly like this, where there's um, two people, one on each side of the screen in a live interaction. Because I think that some of the other options we'll talk about at the end that you can ask for, um, or maybe that they're already doing, um, I think those are you know, good ones and it can really supplement a, a robust distance learning plan. But I, I think this is the one that really is the most unknown and the one that we probably need the most information about. So is telehealth a good fit? How do we know? I would say if when in doubt, try it out. I, I think you really don't know until you try it. I think you can think about a lot of other things to decide, but really giving it a try is probably gonna be the best, the best way to figure it out. And I say that because um, when I first, um, when we first transitioned to this model at TLC, we had about 75 clients that we were trying to transition over. And um, you know, a lot of the families said, I, I don't think it's gonna work. I, you know, he doesn't pay attention to the screen. He doesn't attend to screens. He can't sit for more than a minute. Um, you know, he doesn't really like the computer. He's, he's not interested in it. And what we're finding is, is that the majority of those, of, of all of our clients of those 75, have tried telehealth and are doing well with it and are continuing it. Um, so the majority of those 75 are, are continuing and, and really, I think, thriving with it. So um, it does take a couple sessions to get your groove, but I think it's certainly worth trying. So to decide if you should try, some things we can think about. The first thing is really adjusting expectations. Um, the therapy won't and can't be the same as it is in school, because again, we talked about a lot of that school model is providing services in groups. Um, it's in a push-in service. So it's gonna be very hard for your SLP or OT to duplicate that experience. There's no, um, there's not the same curriculum. There's not the same teachers. There's, there's maybe the groups are different. The, the kids are different. So I think that that's gonna be hard. Um, the other thing, like I said, is to remember that it takes several sessions to establish routines and what the children understand are the expectations for therapy. And that's in a brick and mortar. That's in a live interaction, um, you know, even if they were in the building. So that is a pretty typical, um, you know, getting ready, settling in um, kind of rate, two, three sessions. Um, you also have to allow for the child to process all these new things that are happening. These are new expectations. Um, there's a new setting. It's a change in routine. So there's a lot for a lot that has to happen. Um, you know, the therapist has to kind of get his or her groove and, and make sure that they're um, getting all the right materials and pacing the session the right way and the right level of reinforcement. It's going to take the family some tries to make sure they're in the right room, that they have the right time of day, that they're, you know, getting it just right. Um, so it, it's going to take a little trial and error. Um, some things you can ask your therapist ahead of time so you know what to expect. Um, I would ask them what you will need to have each time, what materials or supplies, what will your role be? Are you going to be expected to sit with an earshot and just be available in case there's technical difficulties? Um, are you going to be expected to really interact and be a part of the session? Are you going to be someone who sits next to the child and just sort of reminds them to attend but isn't really involved? What is your role going to be? What does the therapist expect? The next thing would be to ask about, can siblings be present? Because they're not going anywhere, you know, they're, they're home with you. So that is something that I think is a reality given the current situation and really does need to be taken into consideration. And I wouldn't be afraid to ask your therapist about what to do about siblings. You know, we, I don't think the majority of, of um, therapists really think that you're gonna be able to somehow find a, a babysitter magically or um, you know, have your sibling, have the siblings be entertained for an entire 30 minute session you know, at, at somewhere else in, an, in another room. I think they're very well aware that that could be a, a, part, of, um, a part of the session. Um, what is the schedule? So what should you expect within that session? 
how much of that session is going to be direct time where the therapist is interacting with your child, how much is going to be spent maybe debriefing or talking with you or answering your questions. Um, I think asking um, what you should expect and what your child should expect ahead of time is going to be something that's going to be very helpful in making your decision. And then the other thing you can ask about is a parent coaching model. And this is something that we found at TLC has been incredibly helpful. And so much so that um, our therapists think this and the feedback we've gotten from parents has been um, just overwhelmingly positive that this is something they hope we can continue even when the building opens up is being able to do our parent coaching model via um, the platform we're using Zoom um, via a telehealth model because they find it incredibly helpful for us to be in their home with them and to be able to help them use their augmentative communication devices during um, snack time or to be able to provide feedback about dressing skills for OT. So this, um, you know, we already do a parent coaching model at TLC, but it's been great to have in telehealth. A parent coaching model is um, used for exactly what it says to, to help parents and coach them to help their children. So this could be something like for speech, um, and as a speech pathologist, unfortunately, my, my um, examples are going to be mostly speech, um, but for speech language, um, that could be something like if your child has difficulty with play or maybe um, reciprocity or functional language skills and you're trying to figure out how to interact with your four-year-old and um, maybe she doesn't like a lot of toys, maybe she's really difficult to engage, um, how, how do you do that? And so the therapist will hopefully give you some ideas and some, um, you know, try this. When you do this, I want you to say it like this or slow down or speed up or use more affect or let's try movement break. And they're going to give you some suggestions. Um, they're going to be modeling some of it for you as well. Um, but it's a really interactive um, reciprocal model. And it really, I feel like helps parents feel more confident when interacting with their child about, um, especially when their child is either difficult to engage or using an augmented communication device or trying to integrate some of the um, sensory integration ideas into their the diet, into their day. Um, you know, the, that parent coaching model can be very, can be invaluable. Um, the other thing to consider is if um, you have the time, the space, the emotional bandwidth to be able to support this model. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. You're, you as the parent are, are no longer just the parent. I mean, you're, you're doing 10 hundred jobs all day long. Um, do you have time? Do you have the emotional bandwidth to be able to gather the materials that are needed to be able to make the time? If you're working from home to be able to make that time, um, to be able to balance that with childcare for siblings. And if you don't, no is a complete sentence. No is okay. It is okay that you feel like this isn't a good thing for you or your family right now. Maybe you'll reconsider it in a couple of weeks. Maybe something will change, but you know, no is an okay answer. It is okay that you don't have, have it in you to be able to do um, this kind of a model. Um, and, and I think being able to sort of advocate for yourself and your family in that way is, is okay. Um, so if you do decide that you wanna you know, give it a try, um, here's some tips that hopefully will we'll make it a, um, a successful endeavor. The first thing is um, to make sure that you let the therapist be the primary person doing the prompting and teaching. It's really hard for children um, who have a language disorder or an attentional difficulty um, to be able to process information to begin with, to be able to integrate and process um, verbal information and visual information and in live time and then to be able to respond. That's challenging. And so when you put two people's voices on um, two people's directions um, on the child at the same time, it's gonna be really hard for your child to be successful. So even though you're used to prompting and being the one who gives directions to your child all day long, try really hard to take a step back and sort of coach from the outside. Let your, your therapist be the person who's giving the direction. Um, and that hopefully will help um, reduce the crosstalk and um, some of the difficulty processing for your child. 
um, discuss with your therapist how a parent coaching model would look specifically for you and for your child. Um, is the expectation that the entire session is going to be parent coaching? Maybe the last 10 minutes will be. Um, you really need to, I think, have a good idea of what to expect. Um, one, so that you can set up the situation, um, the gather the supplies and, and make the environment a good one. But also, I, I think it makes you feel more confident. Um, you're going to be, um, you know, having a lot of things to juggle at one time and having those questions in the back of your mind, I, I think is just an extra burden. So really having that relationship, that dialogue with your therapist, so you know what to expect, I think is important. If you don't know what's expected of you, if you don't know if you're supposed to go after the child or wait for the therapist to, to try and verbally redirect, if you don't know if it's your job to, at that moment, reinforce your child, if you don't know if, it's, if you're supposed to be, um, you know, interacting with the child or um, letting the therapist do it, if, if you're not quite sure, ask. It's okay to ask. You're not expected to be a mind reader. And, you know, the therapist in that moment, he or she may forget that she hasn't or he hasn't given you um you know an additional direction um and so it, it, i think there's going to be um a lot of um a lot of back and forth between you and the therapist just trying to figure out you know what would be the best thing for your child um so don't i, I wouldn't even worry about it. i would just keep checking in is that what you want me to do do you want me to do this and just make sure that you're on the same page um with your child's therapist the other thing um, that I would recommend, and um, I, I think, um, you know, my clients and, and my staff um, for the last 15 years have, have heard me say this over and over and over again, all my trainings that I do is wait, is the best thing, the best gift, the best tool in your toolbox that you can give your child is to wait, allow your child time to respond. And waiting is going to feel really long. It's going to feel really awkward, but what I recommend is that families um, give their child upwards of five seconds, count your five Mississippis, um, to be able to respond. Because remember that they're processing your facial expressions, your tone of voice, they're processing, um, they're trying to remember what you just said. They're trying to, um, you know, process maybe um, ignoring external um, noise. Maybe they're trying to process what's happening inside them sensory wise. Um, and so they, they really need that time to put that information together. And then they need the time if they have a language disorder or processing issue to be able to formulate a response and get it out. And so that allows them the time to be able to process it, but it also allows the time for them to be able to formulate and organize their thoughts and organize their answer and get it out before they've lost the floor, before they've sort of lost their turn in that interaction. So allowing your, chi your child a lot of wait time, um, really holding off on the cues and the prompts, that's gonna be you know, very helpful. Um, my next tip would be don't be afraid to be silly, to laugh and, and to have fun. You know, we always say play is the work of childhood. Play is hard work, but it can also be fun, just like it is on um, for this little guy who was doing some OT um, homework at TLC last week. Um, and I think that's something else to think about. Um, I've been working with families um, for years in, in doing, um, you know, parent coaching and observations and such. Um, and so I think for some families, it can be a little um, off-putting or anxiety-ridden to be able to be uh, silly and to play in front of somebody else. Um, you know, some some parents that's a very uncomfortable position for them, and and that's that's fine. Um, so think about that, but also that um, you know your therapist is very used to being very um, silly and you know wearing um, pens on their heads as hats and very small Mr. Potato Head glasses on their eyes. Um, you know, we're used to walking around with stickers um, on our faces and we're, we're really used to being just, you know, silly and goofy and ridiculous in general. So, um, you know, we're not judging, we're not thinking of, of anything and uh, we're, we're very used to that. So, you know, be as silly as you feel comfortable, but um, a, a lot of that um, being, um, you know, that high engagement, that's really gonna get a lot of out of, out of our kids, um, very successful strategy. So another tip for, for making telehealth um, a successful model is to ask for carryover work. And this is what sometimes people call homework. 
um, you know, speech homework or, or OT homework. This is really important. This is really important for generalization to be able to do the skills in therapy, um, to be able to do the skills at home that a child does in therapy. So that's going to be really important for your child for learning. Um, I always tell my, my families that if you can do it in my room, it's worth five points. If you can do it at Target, it's worth 100 points because that's what we want. It's great that my child, my client can request for something in my room and, and use a great um, carrier phrase and say, I want cup. But what I really want is for him to be able to do it anywhere with anyone at any time. And so that's what we're looking for, that generalization, that carryover. And so the way to get generalization is to ask for carryover work, to be able to, to use these things at home. So some techniques to be able to do that um, would be to integrate activities into daily routines, therapeutic activities into daily routines. That's going to be, um, I'll say the easiest, but it's not easy. Um, it's hard, I think, to carve out time to do speech homework. It's hard to carve out time to do OT homework. It'll be easier if it's already integrated into something you're doing. And so that could be something like brushing teeth, that could be getting dressed, getting ready for bed, taking a bath, even um, the ride to work um, or ride to school, which of course we don't have anymore. Um, but a lot of the um, articulation homework that I give my clients is all in the car. Um, and I always try and do it with, you know, at the third, when every time you get to a red light, try this five times, because it's, it's very hard to just somehow find 15 minutes a night to be able to sit down and, and do our words and you know that's just not realistic um so if you can give yourself a little bit of time to work it into a daily routine then i think you're going to find that's easier than trying to carve out speech homework time um, other ideas for carryover work would be books um, not all kids attend to books um, some kids um, really don't engage with books yet and, and that's just not a great thing um, for them. But for kids that do, um, books can be a great opportunity to um, work on um, fine motor skills like turning pages, um, joint attention. Joint attention is where you're doing the same thing at the same time with your child. Um, so for example, both looking at a book, both looking at bubbles being blown, um, that would be joint attention. Um, play. So, you know, play is hard work, but, but play is something that is hard for a lot of our kids. Um, and that's why we need to sort of uh, work on it. And so hopefully your therapist can give you techniques and strategies to be able to make play successful because it can be hard to do. Um, you know, there's tips um, are, um, that your therapist can give you at TLC. Um, we use the floor time um, techniques from DIR floor time a lot. Um, and I think that that's an incredible model to be able to help with play. Um, some of our therapists, including myself, are Hannon certified, um, and Hannon is, is really all about teaching parents to teach their children um, play, engagement, learning, um, language skills, so um, that could be helpful. But you can also integrate occupational therapy into play. You know, if you're working on fine motor skills, going for a walk, and um, one of the OTs had suggested this at TLC, but picking um, flowers or, or grass is a great way to work on um, fine motor skills. Um, and that could be, that's play. Um, you could also ask your therapist to send you access to your child's boom cards. Boom cards are um, a technique that um, therapists have been using for um, a little bit to be able to um, work online, um, provide telehealth services. And so it's a website and um, the therapist can make these cards, these interactive materials, and they can really, do, it's just a blank card and the therapist can do anything they want with them um, to work on a variety of skills. And um, they're usually individualized for that client or they may be something that the therapist finds on a website like Teachers Pay Teachers. And you know maybe it's just gonna be um, problem solving and um, the therapist will use that to interact and, and to help your child. But sometimes um, they can make them available in a separate um, classroom. Um, a separate um, model for them that they're able to access that and they can kind of practice that. Um, other times, you know, your therapist may say, no, they don't recommend that that is an okay model. Um, I have a couple clients using boom cards now and I wouldn't recommend that my clients use them on their own. Um, I, I think it would be best if they really just reserve them for therapy. So it's something to ask about depending on the needs of your child, how your child learns, how your child responds. 
Um, the other thing would be information on social thinking strategies. So asking for, um, you know, anything that you can be doing to spotlight some of those strategies um, to be used at home. Um, word list for articulation, of course. Um, and then real life experiences. These are always more important, more impactful. These will make more changes to the brain than apps or screens or any of that. I have no problem. If you have to get down a load of laundry, you do what you need to do. If that, you know, if your child needs to play on the iPad for a little bit so you can make dinner, have at it. But if you're trying to make changes to the brain in terms of language skills, in terms of play skills, engagement skills, social thinking skills, social pragmatic language skills, um, even literacy, it's going to be better and more effective to do it in person to do it with books, to do it with play, to do it with conversations. Um, if you are gonna use apps, and certainly therapists do, we, you know, technology isn't, isn't all bad, you just gotta use it the right way, um, to, to balance that and to make sure that it's truly a joint interaction, that it's a guided interaction, that you're doing it with your child as opposed to letting your child do it independently. Um, and so those could be um, some apps I listed here, My Playhouse, Toka Boca, Mr. Potato Head, Connect Four. You know, these are really going to be things that you can do together with your child. Um, the other thing is discussions about movies and, and TV. Um, one of the techniques I've used with when I've done home services, um, and I say it's it's very annoying TV because sometimes um, the child really, you know, doesn't take to this model that it would really irk them, would be to watch um, TV or maybe a snippet of a movie and to have um, some guided conversation. Um, I have some clients that would never work with. If you stopped it halfway and, and taught that would, talked and, and asked questions that would ruin the whole thing, they wouldn't do it. And I understand. I'm a huge Eagles fan. If I was watching my Eagles game and someone came and interrupted me every six minutes and asked me, I, it would not be a fun game anymore. So I understand that that wouldn't work. But um, sometimes I'll, I'll tell my, my um, clients, you know, we're going to watch this Berenstein Bears video, but um, the first five minutes or first 10 minutes, I'm going to stop it and tell you what I'm thinking. I may not ask questions, I may just model um, some social thinking skills and sort of spotlight some things I want them to think about, but I'll let you watch the three minutes, no interruption. So that's another way to use TV or movies in a maybe more constructive way. And the next thing you could do is videotape yourself using um, carryover tasks, carryover activities, show your therapist and see if you're on the right track. And I think sometimes it's hard to know that when you're at home, am I doing this right? Is this what he means? So the next part um, we'll talk about is your role. So what is your role? Um, your role is going to be to share what's going on with your child. Um, let your therapist know what's important. You know, your child's gonna be changing week to week. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's come up in therapy at TLC is the, um, the parents had, you know, for one client I'm thinking of had said they really wanna work on conversation skills because at school, the child's not interacting with their friends at recess. Well, now recess is gone and that child um, is having some anxiety difficulties and is having some difficulties at home and overreacting. And so now we've really focused for, you know, put that on the back burner and only doing it for a little bit of time. And now the majority of our work is going to be on the social thinking concept size of the problem and really making sure that we're having small reactions to small problems instead of big reactions to small problems. Um, have something to write down what the therapist um, is telling you to, to do and to practice so you don't have to worry about remembering it. Provide your therapist with feedback. I think it went well when we. Um, can we try this next time? I think he did best when. And then ask your therapist for feedback. That two-way street is going to be really important. Um, and the next thing would be to model flexibility. Things are going to go wrong. Something's going to go wrong. The, the video is not going to work. The audio is going to cut out. The therapist is going to freeze on the screen. The water is going to spill. Something's going to go wrong. The device isn't going to work or turn on, and it's okay. And the more flexible you can be um, in front of your child, the calmer your child will remain. Um, your role will also include, of course, preparing the materials, having everything you know ready to go, maybe some backups. Um, if your child has a speech generating device, having it charged and turn on because it's going to be too hard to have that cord to power it to move around during the session. Um, and the next thing I would ask as a therapist, I, I ask my clients is, if you can, have your child have that input, that sensory input they need before the session. 
do 10 jumps in place, maybe carry the laundry detergent container from one end of the room to the other. Um, I ask my clients a lot to move the ceiling, push, jump, 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 get that ceiling, move it out. Um, push the wall, move the wall back three inches, jump as hard as you can, see if you can get the floor to move. Um, just something to have that child's body ready to work. So, you know, you've gathered everything, you've done everything that you can do, and it's still hard, you know, because our kids don't always um, follow all the rules that they're supposed to be, you know, sitting and attending, you know, ready to go. Um, so we have some challenging behaviors. Um, the first thing I would recommend with challenging behaviors is to have um, as much of the discussion to address those behaviors with your um, clinician ahead of time, via email, via phone, via Zoom, however you want to do it. But just try to reduce talking about your child in front of your child. Um, I think just for, you know, basic human respect, um, you know, even if you think your child doesn't understand, I think we always assume competency and, and um, I wouldn't like it if someone did it to me, but also, um, you know, we, we just don't want to have our child sort of um, internalize that, that, that there's something wrong and that it needs to be addressed and, and hearing even that tone of voice. Um, so as much as you can do ahead of time, I would. Um, it's important to, um, to plan ahead also to make it more successful. So one of the things that I would recommend is to start with decreasing the demands and increasing the preferred activities. You can always switch it and um, start to reduce it um, as the child is more successful. And that's what you're waiting for. When that child's successful, you can start switching that. We don't necessarily wanna reward success with more work. So we're gonna do it gradually. Um, you know, if you did a great job at work, usually you get paid more money but sometimes we know this happens. If you do a great job at work, sometimes you get more work. And so um, that's really not gonna increase the motivation to continue you know, next time. Um, if your child's having difficulty, see if you can take a step back and reflect, maybe when the session's you know, well and done, what could have been stressing that child? What could have been acting as a stressor? A sensory stressor, maybe um, the, the reinforcement wasn't enough, maybe the activity was too challenging. Um, increase the reinforcement. That, usually helps. Um, reinforcement is anything that increases the likelihood that the behavior will continue. And so, you know, if, if you want a behavior to continue, then think about increasing the reinforcement for that. Offer choices whenever possible. Alternate with preferred and non-preferred. First we'll do my choice, then we'll do yours. Um, start with a shorter session. Maybe just start with 15 minutes and work up to 30 or work up to 20 minutes. Spotlight preferred behaviors. You're doing such a nice job sitting right now. I love that you're coloring that circle. Look at you using two fingers to hold that crayon. Way to go. All of that specifically re specific uh, reinforcement will really let your child know exactly the thing that they're doing that you would like them to do in the future. Um, it's easier to, to label and model the thing that you want as opposed to the thing that you don't want. So instead of saying something like, um, stop running around the room, Maybe we could say, I need you to sit crisscross applesauce right here. That's the preferred behavior. That's what we're looking for. So ask for that as opposed to saying, don't do that or, or not that. Um, decide ahead of time how your therapist will handle non-preferred behaviors. Are you gonna ignore it? Are you gonna address it? Who's gonna address it? Is the parent gonna address it? Is the therapist gonna address it? How's that gonna look? Get, that, um, get on the same page with that. Um, other things to do in terms of problem solving, um, sometimes visual schedules help. Um, ChoiceWorks is an app um, that you can look into if, if that would help maybe help organize your child's day, or organize the session. You can also just take photos with your cell phone of preferred activities and swipe. Um, sometimes that, that's just a real cheap, easy way to help your child make choices or, or make a schedule. Siblings, if your siblings are, are part, of the, um, part of the fun, you can use them as peer models, maybe. Um, give them jobs if they really feel like they're not part of it. And I think that's hard for siblings to not have that attention, even if um, they're not understanding that it's, um, you know, the, the child um, in therapy may think of it as work, but the sibling might not see it that way. So we at TLC, we've done um, having them have jobs and feel really important. They're the star chart keeper, or they're the ones who give the, the smiley faces. They turn the pages of the book. They can pick out the next activity. 
Um, we allow them some time one on one with the therapist. So for the first minute of the session, they can show the therapist something fun. Um, for the last one minute of the session, they can, you know, um, talk to the therapist and the therapist will be very enthusiastic. Um, maybe the child was working for a dance party and the sibling gets to push play on mom's dad's phone to, um, to start the music. Maybe we're going to do um, freeze dance and the sibling gets to be the one to stop the music. Um, the next thing is if a child has poor attention. Children need a lot of movement breaks. You know, the average um, attention span um, of children is, is generally like two, three, sometimes five minutes. They're not meant to sit for a 30 minute session. And if they were in therapy, they would be getting a lot of sensory movement breaks. So um, don't insist that they remain seated. There's usually nothing wrong with a child standing up for the whole therapy session. Sometimes pacing back and forth while still listening is fine. Um, so instead of insisting they remain seated, you know, maybe encourage them to stand up and move a little bit. Talk to your OT, maybe they need a fidget, um, something to do with their fingers while they're still listening. Um, really great um, interactive uh, movement breaks um, are found on Go Noodle. Um, Popsy Co is a great song, but I warn you, it'll get stuck in your head. Um, but Cuckoo Kangaroo is a group. They got a lot of really goofy, ridiculous songs, but the kids love them. They're very engaging um, and they can be um, interactive, especially if you do it with your, your child. Um, so maybe do something like that before the session or take a quick movement break in the middle. Um, sometimes just drinking um, cold water through a straw can be very organizing. Um, getting up and going to get the water and come back, that little walk could be all they need. Um, yoga could provide some deep pressure, some input for them to be able to be able to continue the session. And then when in doubt, shorten the tasks. Maybe they can only sit for one minute. They can only attend for one minute. Alternate that. Okay, we do one minute on, one minute um, off, one minute on, one minute off. Um, so kids um, who are pre-verbal, um, not yet using their words or, and or using AAC devices, um, we found that telehealth has been an excellent model, excellent model. Um, we've gotten so much great feedback from parents who have kids with AAC devices and, and who are um, um, pre-verbal. And the reason is, is that telehealth really does work with a lot of different um, kinds of learners. And we found that because um, the, the families really are valuing the parent coaching model and getting that feedback and feeling more confident um, about using the device because they're not uh, always so intuitive. Um, so, you know, it's just some ideas for pre-verbal children and really, you know, a lot of other kinds of kids, um, but be prepared to move around, be prepared um, to have a, um, a parent coaching model um, I think that's going to be your most successful. Um, if you're not sure about where all the buttons on your child's device are, ask the therapist ahead of time what targeted words, usually core words, they're going to be working on so you can find that pathway so you're not searching and getting flustered. Um, the other thing to consider is um, telling your therapist again, letting them know what your child's doing at home and preferring at home. Um, related service providers, like I said, support curriculum, but your life is the new curriculum. And so the more engaged these children can be, the more successful, the more applicable it is to them, to their, their preferred interests, the more successful. Um, in floor time, we call that following their lead. It doesn't mean they get you know, to rule the roost or, or get to make all the choices, but it does mean that we follow the way that they would like to interact. We use the, um, look at their cues in terms of our affect and, and how we would interact with them. Um, and then the last thing is, is asking the therapist if they could use their activities instead of doing maybe something that you could never duplicate, ask them to use um, daily living tasks as part of their session so you can see what they mean. When they say, when he eats, push the button, you know, sit down and show the device and say, show me how you would do that. How, how would that really look in real life? And have that activity be something that you're doing as part of the therapy so that you can duplicate that more easily. What if you um, these tips don't work. What if you've done all the problem solving and it, it's not going well and you would like a different model? Or what if you've already decided this isn't going to be um, something that's successful for you or your child or your family? Um, the first thing is don't feel like you have to be the therapist. You're the parent and that is enough. There's enough going on right now. You don't need to try to duplicate these services. Um, the analogy I've used with my families who are quite overwhelmed is think about if you signed up for swim class. Um, we can't have swim class right now. You know, swim class is canceled. 
And at no time are parents thinking, I really have to be the swim class provider. I have to somehow find a pool. I have to somehow teach my child to swim. I think if you said to that, to a family, you know, how are you doing distance learning for swimming? Most parents would say, you're, that, that's not gonna happen, you're crazy. How could you possibly duplicate that? And I think in some ways we have to, as, as parents kind of give yourself that grace to know that you can't possibly duplicate that. Um, so it's okay to, to be the parent. It's okay to not wear seven other hats. Um, and so to that end, I wouldn't try to run drills or table time. Um, like I've talked about, integrating the skills into daily routines and to play is much more meaningful. You'll make more changes to the brain that way than you will with flashcards. Um, and so again, you know, asking for your child's therapist for carryover into daily routines rather than saying, I want 10 minutes of speech homework, I want worksheets, I want flashcards, um, you know, those things aren't going to make the kind of changes I think that we're, we're looking for. Um, for articulation, um, sometimes fun ways to switch things up, maybe use the camera on your phone instead of a mirror. Um, kids find that very engaging. Um, video your your child doing the session, or sorry, doing the, um, the productions, you could send that to your therapist and see if um, that, uh, the child's on the right track or if this is what they mean. Um, I usually don't have lots and lots and lots of word lists. I usually give the child um, like five that they can put on a post-it note on a mirror when they brush their teeth. And then I have them listen um, for good ones or try agains. And they really like to videotape themselves and watch and, and judge themselves and, and rate themselves with good ones and try agains. Um, and then uh, using the remainder, reminder or the notepad app on your phone, um, if you type out those words, those targeted words, the, a lot of kids like to check off the words um, as they do them, um, and that could be a way to kind of get that homework in. Um, uh, other, other techniques would be to sort of think outside the IEP. Um, story time, I think because we've talked about ADLs enough, story time. Um, when you're watching TV, if you want to do that guided um, watch, that, that guided TV session or story time, would be to use think, wonder, and notice language rather than questions. And so you're going to maybe read a page and say, oh, wow, I think that caterpillar is so hungry, he keeps eating. Or I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder if the fox will fit in that mitten. Or I noticed that that little boy got very mad when his sister came in. So you're not asking questions. You're not asking, what letter is it? What color is it? What does the dog say? Um, you're, you're instead using comments and trying to engage the child that way. That's that internal script or dialogue that a lot of kids with autism don't have, that theory of mind, sort of knowing how other people are thinking or how other people are feeling. This will really help them put that information in their head. We tell our kids all the time, say please, say thank you, and they hear us do it, um, but they, they kind of need that model. They need it to hear us say please and thank you a hundred times for them to be able to really, you know, get it in there. And so the same idea is um, with this other kind of language. They need to hear us model this for them to really understand it and, and, um, and, and make it stick. Modeling is important. I tell families all the time, Use comments instead of questions whenever you can. If you don't know if your child wants milk or juice, ask a question. But if you're trying to teach or model language or um, you know, ask them how they're tying their shoe, instead of saying, well, do you get the laces? Do you get the laces? Let's get the laces. Maybe just telling them or modeling, do it this way, um, really helps. Teaching without testing will get much better results. Um, there's some studies that show that asking questions, um, as well as switching attention, actually, um, elicit the fight or flight response in the brains of individuals with autism. And so the more that we can engage with our clients or kids with, um, with modeling, with comments, with affect, um, it doesn't even have to be a word, it could just be, ah, that's going to make a lot more um, impact. Um, the next thing would be um, work on conversation skills. You can do this without therapy. You can do this on FaceTime with a friend or a relative, um, with a sibling, but there's lots of ways to practice um, our child's skills without necessarily having therapy. Um, the other um, ideas would be to have obstacle courses. You know, OTs, um, when they have um, sessions, telehealth sessions, their parent coaching, 
looks like to obstacle courses and scavenger hunts. Um, you know, you are the, the OT's hands in a lot of ways, but a lot of our clients um, and um, a lot of your, your children aren't necessarily going to be sitting working on, you know, handwriting tasks or, or cutting and, and pasting. A lot of the um, um, students are going to be really working on um, uh, motor planning and sensory um, seeking um, sensory diets to, to either help them um, with um, low arousal or to be able to help them, you know, to get high arousal to get their engine just right. So um, obstacle courses are a great way to do that. And you could ask your therapist um, maybe for some feedback or input about how that would look for your child. But obstacle courses, scavenger hunts, that's going to be what a lot of the parent coaching um, model could look like in, in a telehealth model for OT. Um, going outside and playing and taking walks, um, you can do that in model, I wonder, I notice, I think, but you can also use that for um, um, practicing some motor skills, um, taking some sidewalk chalk and making squares for your child to hop into, or, um, you know, that, that can provide a lot of feedback for the feet, um, that jumping. So asking your therapist for different suggestions um, of ways to do that. Um, one of our therapists suggested to work on fine motor skills, you know, she doesn't have any for the parent doesn't have the manipulatives at home that, that we have. So she was pretty creative and thought of maybe stringing pasta on a shoelace or picking flowers or using tweezers to pick up cotton balls or using squirt bottles. Um, these are all great ways to work on fine motor skills. And, and again, your therapist can help you um, maybe with some of that carryover. Um, taking movement breaks at home. The more you practice those movement breaks at home, then the more normal and natural will be for the child and in this, in, um, for them to, to decide, oh, I could use this break right now. Um, I'm feeling like my engine's running too high or too low. This is the thing I could do because in the past when this has happened, this is how mom or dad have helped me to get my engine just right. Um, you can also ask for help with sensory activities um, to provide experiences for your child throughout the day. Um, this could be sensory boxes and, you know, maybe um, like a Rubbermaid container or a bag with noodles or rice in it. Um, water play is always great. Shaving cream if you have any to spare. Um, carrying heavy items. Um, we used to tell parents, you know, to get foam books and, and wrap them up with tape, but, you know, they're a little hard to find now. Um, but uh, laundry detergent is great. If you have an empty container, um, you can fill it with rice or beans and then it's, you know, permanently heavy and, and um, you can, uh, that, that's great for heavy work for providing input um, for your child. Um, but there's lots of different ways to integrate sensory experiences throughout the day. Um, and that could really help your child get through the day, but then also, you know, learn how, um, what they need to self-regulate. So the best tools in your toolbox always are going to be modeling. It is always going to be the most effective thing to model your preferred um, you know, either behavior or modeling the language or modeling the social thinking strategy or modeling self-regulation, um, you know, for your child. So, um, you know, I encourage my families to say like, oh, that was really frustrating. Hmm. You know what? I think I'm going to give myself some um, five from some um, five candle breathing right now. I'm going to blow out my candles. <sighs> You get the point, draw, you know, blow out all five. And so even if you're not having a particularly stressful moment, your child's watching you handle that and self-regulating with a strategy that he or she is also using, that's going to really uh, make an impact. Um, the wait time, letting your child respond, giving your child enough time to process and to formulate an answer, making it fun. Brains learn better when they're engaged. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it's, easy to make something um, a lot of work, but it's hard to make something a lot of fun. So I recognize that it is hard to sometimes figure out what is fun, but if you can figure it out and, and integrate it whenever possible, you're going to get a lot more um, out of your child, a lot more learning. Um, and the next thing is make it a routine. The more that you can integrate it into your life, the easier it will be to be able to practice it and the easier it will be for your child to be able to um, to uh, generalize it as well. So, you know, lots of tools, lots of information. Some of this is going to work for your child, some of it's not. And I think it's important to put together a plan um, that's going to sort of um, be a, a distance learning plan that's going to be best for your child. 
that could be a combination of services privately, that could be a combination of um, services from Montgomery County, or, or maybe not at all. But, you know, thinking outside the IP, I think advocating for your child is going to be um, important in this situation because it's not going to be possible for your service, uh, your related service provider to provide the services exactly as they were in, in school. They can't duplicate it. So, you know, what can you, what can you ask for from Montgomery County what, or Frederick or, or whomever? Um, you know, if you can't get your 30 minute small group, because sometimes small groups can be really challenging. Um, you know, it is, it can be really hard for um, some of our kiddos with autism to be able to participate in a small group to begin with. And then to put it in a video, um, you know, um, model such as this can be even harder. You know, we work really hard to get them to use whole body listening, to think with their eyes, and that's gonna be hard to do. They're not gonna get that feedback because they're not switching attention. They're looking at a, a screen. Um, it may be hard to know who's talking. Um, it may be distracting to see things in the background. And so even if a, of a group is something that you feel like your child needs, it may not be successful right now in this model um, as a way to practice conversation skills or whatever skills you know you were you were hoping to practice. Um, so you know maybe asking Montgomery County for some of these carryover tasks that you could do that may be even better for your your child right now. Um, you know something that I use as part of my therapy is Vook V O O K like book with a V, um, Vook.com and they have a they have a special right now where you can. Um, um, you know, have an account for free, um, but they provide books, um, like animated books, popular books, and, um, you know, maybe having a book group, having your child watch a, a book or um, on, um, on their own, and then having um, a Zoom meeting with another, you know, client, another, another student, sorry, to, to um, discuss that. That could be helpful. Maybe ask your therapist if they can do a five minute meeting um, and sort of set the scene um, and just do five minutes of instruction and then the therapist can drop out and you and the other parent can um, do 15 more minutes and, and see if you can practice um, doing some um, coaching with your children in that way. Um, you know, that's sort of like a virtual play date. And so that, you know, you don't want to be the therapist, but really it's sort of just good practice for hosting a play date, you know, because at that point it's not therapy anymore. Um, so it would just be a play date. Um, you know, asking for maybe just five minutes of articulation work, sending that video to your, your therapist saying, are we on the right track? Maybe checking in every two weeks. That could be a way to get some um, feedback um, from your therapist. Um, for occupational therapy, same thing. I'm trying to teach my child how to tie a shoe. Does this look right? Am I giving the right instructions? Is this what you mean? Um, I'm trying to have my child practice some of these sensory strategies. This is what happens when I do this, when I give him deep pressure. This is what happens when we spin. Is this what you mean? Um, you know, getting them to give you that feedback so you know if you're on the right track or not, I, I think would be important. Um, I think, you know, you can just advocate and ask for whatever you think is appropriate. And, um, I think there's, you know, with your child, you, you just sh shoot for the moon. Um, the worst they can do is say no. Um, but I, I think, you know, ask for what you think is best. But um, these are some, some suggestions just to kind of um, know what to ask for, know how to get the ball rolling. So, um, well, I, I appreciate the, everyone um, attending and, and I thank you all um, for um, listening and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Tina. That was a lot of great information, all very practical information too. So thank you for being so specific, it's terrific. Um, now we're gonna get to the question and answers portion of the program. Um, since you actually addressed in your talk all the questions that were submitted ahead of time, we can go straight, straight to the chat. And so for that, we'll turn to Laura, who's been monitoring the questions in the chat. Yep, so, um... I ha we had a couple people talk about how their OT sessions seem to be very talk heavy mm -hmm. um, and wondering why that might be right now. Like why it doesn't seem like there's just a lot of talking with the child. I don't know if the specifics um, here, but um, uh, it sounds like parents are wondering why it's not more um, maybe tasks, task oriented. And I don't know if you have any insight as to why that would be, maybe it's establishing the model. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a couple, um, 
guesses, but I, I think, you know, without knowing that child, I, I think it'd be, you know, hard to nail it down. But um, one could be, yeah, maybe establishing rapport, establishing the new routine. But I think a lot of that, you know, that talk is, is parent coaching. And so that it could be sort of the new normal that, you know, they're not able to have the same tasks because the parents aren't going to have those same materials. Um, you know, the majority of families are probably not having suspended equipment, trampolines, ball pits, you know, happening in their living room. Um, you know, it's going to be hard for them to find um, maybe the right therapeutic scissors. Maybe you have children's scissors, but maybe those aren't the scissors that your child was using in the classroom. Um, maybe your child has an augmented um, grip for, for writing and maybe you don't have that very special $10 grip. Um, you know, maybe your child is, maybe the um, therapist is not used to doing um, tasks, but rather pushing into the classroom. And so your child's not used to doing seated tasks. Um, and so they're trying to push into your new, the new curriculum. And like I said, that new curriculum is going to be, you know, your daily life experiences. Um, so that talk, I would guess, is probably that parent coaching model in action. Um, and, you know, you're not, the, your child's probably not going to, you know, um, work heavily on their IEP goals, but the whole idea of the IEP is to work on goals that your child needs in life. And so, you know, it may not look the same, but, you know, but, but really the underlying skills should still be being targeted. And it sounds like, like you said, um, you know, if we're not sure, we should just ask the therapist, say, hey, totally ask why therapist. are we talking so much? <laughs> right? Like, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe the therapist thinks they're being helpful. Maybe they're, they, they think that they're answering lots of questions and maybe they're thinking, I'd really like to get to a seated task. Or maybe they're thinking this isn't the right um, venue for that. You know, maybe this isn't, isn't what they had in mind. So yeah, I would, I would definitely ask them, but my guess is, is that it's probably that parent coaching model in action. Okay. Um, and I, oops, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm um, Trisha Tandle and I'm an OT. And I'm doing a lot online. It depends on the resources that the OT has. Um, and it I mean, I, my parents, half of my parents aren't even seated with their kids. And sometimes the parents are seated with the kids because the children are too young. They can't work independently. They wouldn't work independently with me. I would be doing hands-on with them. But a lot of times, I think it's probably just our school system was really great. We got those materials out to them. We got, um, uh, we got all the packets of things for them to work on, hand stuff, exercise activities, videos. We got those all out. So maybe they should talk to their OT. I think that was a really a good suggestion. They should talk to their uh, OT and suggest that maybe they could look up some resources um, and could send them some information so that the, it's not just a talking between the parent and the OT. There's more actually three-way interaction with the kids. Right. Okay. All right. Thank, yep. Thank you for that. Um, another question was, and I have dealt with this personally, sort of the, I guess, first of all, you know, for example, today, my son had three sessions, uh, three right. video sessions. And um, by the end of the third one, you know, there was a problem, right? He was done. It was too much. Um, have you seen any examples, and this might, you know, this model makes it harder of any um, like OT speech combining um, to, um, you know, make the frequency of the sessions less, you know what I mean? Trying to combine yeah. the sessions a little more, or have you seen any creative? Um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, that co-treat um, is really hard to execute. Mm -hmm. um, in the private practice world, it, it's one of those um, things where people, you know, we always say, well, it would be so great if I could have a speech SLP or an OT in the room right now, you know, for the co-treat. Um, and, and a lot of times it is. Um, but insurance, if you're doing private practice, um, insurance won't cover it. So you're, you're not likely to do that if you are doing teletherapy from a, a private practice model. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, the county, um, I don't know what they're, given the new rules, you know, what, what that would look like, but I would imagine that it would be very hard for a child to attend in that, in that 
it's hard enough to tend to the video. You know, it's hard enough when they're not in person to keep someone engaged. You know, it, it's hard enough to listen to more than one direction. Um, so I, I would maybe talk to the OT and the SLP and let them know that this is the problem and see if they can modify their tasks, modify their demands, increase their reinforcement, modify their sessions in some way to make that more successful, knowing that Tuesday is going to be a very heavy therapy day. Um, and I know that, you know, I know when, um, when my, my clients, I know when they have classes and we've scheduled me before that, before the schooling, because it was too hard and too stressful for me to be, you know, after them. Um, and so we worked that out with scheduling, um, to, to sort of find the right order, the sweet spot. Um, yep. Yep. Okay. So that, that may be, but again, you know, you know, when you have therapists who have 70 kids on their caseload, um, that, that may not happen, you know, and, and a lot of therapists um, are parents as well, and they're finding a hard time, um, you know, being able to have the time to be able, and they, you know, they may not, um, I know a lot of therapists, you know, you know, maybe their partner is staying home on Monday so they can get all their sessions done on Monday, and they don't have Friday at, you know, at noon. So you know, there could be some of that as well. Okay. Um, one technical, and this might be something that you have some insight in, like a technical question is, have you found, so, and I see this with my son and I've gotten some comments I can see here. Um, the, uh, just the actual, like, um, uh, audio of the session, um, can be a problem. So, you know, their delay, you know, there could be a delay, there could be like a feedback. Mm -hmm. Have, ha, are there any technical, like actual, like technical um, solutions that you found, like, you know, that might be helpful in preventing some of those frustrations? Now, you know, the frustration, um, you know, that's happened to me I, every week. Um, so one of the things is when two people are talking at the same time, it's the computer kind of can't handle it. So things are going to go out. So that's the first thing. Um, and I know that's hard to do. Um, but as the therapist, I usually have to be the one to just stop talking, you know, and, and kind of pull back. Um, that sometimes will help with freezing and, and sounds coming in and out and, and that sort of, um, you know, the, the incomplete signal. Um, the second thing is, is that um, happened to me yesterday, the sound went out. And so I um, quickly uh, emailed the parent. So, you know, the therapist needing to have that contact information like on hand. I mean, I have a list right next to me. Um, and so the therapist, the, um, you know, and I guess this, this may be hard for Montgomery County or Frederick County or something, but um, I'm able to make calls um, from my work number from my phone, you know, so, um, so the, the client was able to call me on my work phone. And so what we did is I, I spent the whole session talking in the phone. The Zoom was muted, oh. the audio was gone. And so then we communicated this way. Um, and so that helped. Um, this morning the sound went out and my client chatted with me to let me know that he couldn't hear me, that I was frozen. And so until that could resolve, we typed back and forth. Um, but the chat has to be able to, to type. Um, we've had it happen where I've, um, you know, a couple days ago, I had no video that I couldn't see the child. So I had to kind of do therapy blind and just, you know, like, can you see me? I hope so. I can't see you at all. Um, and just sort of, you know, roll with it and keep going. Um, yep. and then I had another instance where the video went out on the child side and he was, that really was very disconcerting. Um, the schedule was different and, you know, that was not what was supposed to happen. That was not the plan. And that was very hard. Um, we use it as a teachable moment. Um, the parent did a great job, you know, helping and coaching. Um, I coached as best I could, you know, with audio, with no video, and, um, you know, made sure that I, I let the child know the plan, that we're going to turn, turn it off. We're going to try again. When we try again, this is what's going to happen. Um, and then I made it as part of the lesson plan, and I made some boom cards surrounding it, and we talked about sometimes the compu and computer goes off and it's hard, um, you know, and in retrospect, I think I probably should have done a better job anticipating that. And I should have probably told the child, hey, welcome to teletherapy. These are some things that we're going to expect. Um, you know, I probably should have spent some more time um, front loading that information and priming the child, you know, to be ready and like, let's practice. Ready? I'm frozen. What yeah, are we yeah, going to do? Okay. You know, maybe doing some, some sort of activities, you know, so that it's not such a, um, 
you know, jarring, uh, you know, experience. Um, and maybe even building in like, oh no, dad, the computer's not working. I guess we have to turn the computer off and start again. And having that like planned, even though the computer's just fine. Oh, we gotta wait, all right. And then when it comes back on, you did such a great job waiting, oh my goodness. Three smiley faces or three minutes with the app or you know, whatever it is. That would be my only thought is like to prime them, get them ready, practice it, you know, and let them know. That's what I meant by, you know, being flexible, modeling the flexibility, like, it's easy to kind of get flustered um, when you're on the other end because this is the therapy and you only have 26 minutes left and you know you really want it to go. So um, I think you're right, but sort of expecting that that's going to happen. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, surely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk briefly a little bit about the preverbal and the AAC devices. Um, do you have an example of how you guys have transitioned um, a preverbal? Um, student with a very low tech um, AAC device from brick and mortar to tell to, to telehealth like have you seen success like specifically um, um I haven't and the only thing is is the most of the kids we have on caseload right now have um speech generating devices okay um you know so it's not that they haven't been successful. I think it's just, um, you know, the, the amount of children. Um, you know, but on the other hand, I've also done, you know, back in the day, um, you know, FaceTime type activities with clients to try and teach PECs. I'm, you know, I'm extremely familiar with PECs and, um, and POD and, and some of those more low tech. Um, I would imagine though, it would be the same because you're really just modeling. Um, you know, you're, you're giving that parent, um, you're setting them up for success, you're letting them with the expectation, you're modeling for the parent how to model for the child, you're modeling a prompting hierarchy. I would imagine it would be similar, um, especially, you know, if that's what the child has. Um, and if you think your child needs an AAC device, give me a call. You know, I'm, I'm happy to, to help you with that and, and know what to ask for. Um, you know, you don't have to contest it with us. We can, we can, I'm happy to walk you through that because, um, I think it's a common misconception that there are some prerequisite skills that children need for AAC devices, and there are no prerequisite skills. You do not know how to match. You do not need to know how to, how to uh, you know, um, read. You do not need have to attend to a device. That's what motor planning is for. Um, there are no prerequisite skills. There are no, you know, if you're old enough to, to supposed to be able to talk developmentally, you're, you're a candidate for a device. Um, and so then, you know, we're happy to help you. Okay. Yeah. And that's a good reminder, everybody. Um, we're, we have some time left, but I'm just going to remind everyone that um, Tina's email is on the slide. Um, she has agreed to answer questions. If you have questions that are not being answered, I'm not getting to everybody's questions, um, but um, she has volunteered to answer those questions. So feel free to follow up with her. Um, and I'm also happy to answer questions, you know, I, um, about any or, or at least put you in the right direction of any of our other services so you know if you're interested in our therapeutic camps or interested in our counseling or, or some of our tutoring or any of that you can still email me i'm happy to to give you the right you know send you on on the right path you know no problem okay okay um let me just see here what else do i have oh um there is a uh have you used jamboard no. at all that app it allows i'm just going to mention it um sure. just because Great. it allows the therapist to see what your child is writing if writing oh is okay what, is if writing is what they're working on um so it's like it's an app you download and the therapist can see what they're doing um so uh, um oh uh one other question was hmm, visual attention that isn't uh, an app uh let's see here uh best advice let's see here best advice i'm working on requesting activity oh no sorry i'm on the wrong question here uh i think i've got the one that you're thinking of it's okay, any, okay. she's asked someone's asking for any other strategies besides affect and interactive apps to capture visual attention of an asd child um to get their attention onto the therapist who's on the screen um, I mean, I, I think then if, if does the 
does the attention necessarily need to be on the therapist? You know, maybe if visual attention is an area of difficulty, then this may not be, you know, the best way to, um, to tax that. You know, if, if that's already an area of difficulty, um, stressing and taxing it, you know, that skill, it may not be the best way to get the most out of your child. So then, um, you know, a parent coaching model may be better. Maybe the child will attend better to something that's moving in real life, like toys on the floor or cause and effect toys or bubbles or something in person. Um, so, you know, maybe you have to be the most exciting thing in the room or the toy has to be, you know, it'd be great if you were, you know, if, if the child attended. But of course, we know that for a lot of our kids, that's very hard. Um, so, you know, having something that the child, you know, in vivo in real life is attending to in the space, that may be where the child's vi visual attention needs to be. Um, if it's already difficult, then, you, you know, you're not going to be able to, I think, um, ask the child to sort of, you know, grow three skill steps, you know, in, in that moment. Um, you can also, again, talk to the therapist. Maybe the therapist is fine with the child not visually attending. You know, maybe that's okay. Um, and maybe the therapist has some suggestions um, about ways that the child can learn, because really that's what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I ask parents all the time, you know, don't say, look at me. That's just not, it's not helpful. It's not necessary. And it can cause some really uncomfortable feelings in um, someone with autism, that direct eye contact. Um, it's more important that the child reference you and look up for information. What do they need to know? Um, you know, what are they getting from using that whole body listening to kind of um, get more information? So, you know, do they really need to look directly at the screen? Um, you know, if that's the way that the therapist has set up um, the lesson plan, then I would ask the therapist to pivot. Um, you, you can't ask the child to compensate in, for that deficit in that moment if they're already trying to work on three other challenges. Yep, that's a great point. Okay. Um, I think uh, we had um, one other question, um, and it might be maybe you just have an example or can just talk very briefly. Um, we've talked um, a lot about, you know, kids. Um, does TLC work? Um, a lot with with teens and speech therapy, uh, oh, definitely. Uh, a, you know, on the spectrum, sort of, how does that look much different? Uh, you know, but the verbal coaching, it's not gonna be about play, it's gonna be about what? Well, it, like, it depends. Yeah. So um, I think it depends on the age and um, developmentally, you know, what those, you know, um, play could be connect four, you know, play could be Jenga. Um, play, um, you know, I, I work with someone, um, who is um, oh, more than 18. Um, we play Django, we paint, um, we do um, a lot of art type activities. Um, and it's not play per se, but it's engagement. It is, um, you know, I'm not working on worksheets. I'm not working on um, flashcards. You know, this particular person, his hobby, um, more so his, his passion is art. So that's his curriculum. And so that's what I'm um, supporting. Um, he also has um, some activities that he uses as like hobbies, you know, as, as just um, that he plays with um, his aides at home or his family at home. And so we play those games um, and, and, and the language around those games and the concepts around those games. Um, so I, you know, I, I understand that, you know, maybe it, it doesn't feel appropriate to, to um, you know, do tickle games with an 18 year old, but um, there are other ways to, to have engagement. Um, I, I've worked with um, a young man I, I worked with from when he was three until he was 15, um, until I switched jobs and, and, and um, you know, he's still in my life. I, I still, we still go out to lunch and I still visit with him. And, um, you know, he's, um, this dates myself, of course, but he, you know, he's like 19. And so um, one of the things we do a lot is just, it looks like a high five game and he'll do a high five, you know, really fast. And then I'll freeze and I'll go a little bit slower and then he'll go a little bit slower. He has to match my affect, but that's a game that he likes to play with me while we're having lunch. Um, and to me, that's play, you know, I think it's age appropriate, more age appropriate play um, than, than maybe, like I said, like having a hide and seek, you know, game. But um, I think you can still have that affect. Now, if, that's developmentally way beyond, you know, where your young adult is, then, um, you know, then some um, conversation skills or just some engagement, you know, like the Jenga or just some of that back and forth, um, I think would still be appropriate. Um, that may be something to email me about so I can find out exactly like developmentally, 
the language skills, the cognitive skills, and then sort of like what, um, you know, who are the people who are going to be interacting and, and what's the expectation? Um, I can probably answer that a little bit more completely. Okay, yep, that's a great point. Yeah, folks, again, if you have very specific um, situations or issues, um, please feel free to go ahead and email Tina directly. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Sue. Do we have anything else, Sue? There was one other specific question. I'm just curious if you have thoughts on this. One person asked um, whether you think it was a good idea to do peers online or should they wait and do it in person? Do you have any thoughts on the value of an online peers? Yeah. Yeah. I think it depends on the child and um, I think it depends on the child and I, I, I hate that answer because it's, it's not a real answer. It's not a take that answer and go kind of answer, but um, I think it does, you know, because it really depends on how well the child does with this model, you know, with, with this, um, this way of implementing services and attention and um, I, so I really do think it would depend on the child. Right, I think maybe that pretty much covers the questions I've seen in the chat, right, Laura? Okay, so um, thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, thank you for having me. You covered a lot of ground and a lot of practical advice. Um, it was really terrific. Um, to everybody who participated tonight, I hope you found this helpful and please look for an email from XMinds tomorrow with a feedback survey. I also wanted to mention, we'll be posting the recording of the program on our website tomorrow. So if you missed any of it, or if you want to watch it again, you'll be able to. I'm also going to post the slideshow on our website. Uh, it's on the page that's called Past Events. And so you'll see that there. Um, and we hope to see you back for our next program next Thursday, when we will host psychologist, Dr. Jacqueline Halpern, who will address a topic that's relevant to so many parents, how to understand and manage challenging behaviors that are getting in the way of distance learning for your ASD student. All right, that's it for now. Many thanks to Tina, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you.